you know, I happen to have this, you know, the, the cutout mesh available for this and I, I hadn't really planned on doing it, but we've got just a couple of minutes here that I think it, it is easy enough to demo at least how you'd get started going about this type of, uh, this type of, uh, process. But someone has asked, you know, can we show, uh, how to replicate wings using, um, you know, call fan foils, and I think they might have edited their response uh, or something, but it was kind of a, a request of a quasi-fit model with uh, wings instead of fuselage bodies. So, you know, sure, why not? Um, let's back the sweep off, and, you know, just because I happen to know, um, let's put this, you know, 0.7, bring the root cord back to something like, you know, 2.6, it's not exact, but uh, we can play around with it. And then let's um, set the taper ratio. And then crank the span out a little bit. Um, okay, so let's just pretend, for the sake of argument, that we are trying to match one of these. And uh, I'll try and set, say, the airfoil right about there so we don't have a whole lot of fuss to deal with. And um, it looks like I need to give this just a little bit. Nope, that's too much. 2.5. That's a little bit more like it. Um, okay. So not exactly in the place that it needs, needs, needs to be. Um, but let's go ahead and see what we can do about this. So we're going to go into model. And we're going to go into fit model. I'm going to try and rotate this around. And again, we're going to pick points. And I'm going to try and select all of these just on this airfoil. Get all these points for us. Say OK. And then because I know that we want to set it to say any U and fix U in this case because it's only a 6 section point six 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 should be. Now let's add target. Now what just happened there? Oh, I know what happened. Got to delete all targets. I picked the wrong geometry. Okay, so be careful what you select in here. Let's try that again. My apologies. All right, now we're going to pick our wing that's all the way down in the bottom again, 0.666, add target. There we go. So it's kind of attaching just on the other side of where it really needs to be. Um, and uh, I should have really put that at like 0.6667, and that would have been more appropriate for this cross-section. So what I'm going to do instead is nudge it just a little bit. And, you know, maybe we don't really have to um, to get this to match out just the way we want. But for the variables, we can come here to our wing and our airfoil, come out to section 1, and let's say... As was requested, we can use um, like a clash shape transformation and uh, do something like this. Um, or even, you know, mm, let's just see what happens if we use one of these. Um, so let's make it a little bit easier on ourselves and use a Carmen Traffitz drop in Epsilon, Kappa, Tau. And let's uh, go to the section and let it iterate on dihedral and twist. And, you know, maybe that'll help it a little bit. But again, a well-posed problem, 45 degrees of freedom, freedom 20 conditions. Um, so let's watch what happens. It might not like me at all, and it might just uh, throw everything out the window. But hopefully, you know, it doesn't do awful, right? So it's getting something... Brandon, while that, while that runs, um, let me just interject... Just because you have uh, degrees of freedom less than conditions doesn't mean it's a well-posed problem. Fair point. <laughs> uh, an important thing to watch out for, looks like you need a span in here too. Um, an important thing to watch out for is that the variables you're adding are not redundant. When you add parameters, um, you know, don't add two variables that could have the same net effect on the shape. Hmm. Because if you do, what will happen is, is the optimizer won't know how to achieve that given goal. And so it'll end up just sort of going off into la-la land of trying to compete those two variables against each other. I see this most often with skinning. If you imagine 
one section of fuselage and you have strength on both sides and there's sort of an infinite number of strengths that are very very give very very similar answers and so through that you don't want to um you just you just don't want to go down that path so well posed certainly degrees of freedom and number of conditions is important but then you want to be careful when you select your parms that they're not redundant uh it looks like you might yeah. need to thicken the trailing edge brandon and, and also give it some sweep control to align the leading edge the other thing i'll say is is dave kinney uh answered the question about transonic arrow in the in the conferences io so if the if the person who asked that is watching um i'll read the answer they said the lift is usually not horrible at transonic speeds drag will be problematic unless you know what you're doing emphasis on no uh, vlm is more likely to be right for the wrong reasons as opposed to the panel method so um and i think that that's those are all very reasonable very true things that the the lift um with the vlm method at transonic speeds is probably better than it has any right to be um so yeah there, Back to you, Brandon. Yep, and uh, all really good points. And you know, this this is kind of the danger here, right? Of using, say, a uh, a CST airfoil and not setting things up the way that you that you really should have. So you can see here that some of these targets, because uh, to be fair, the distance. You know, I can search UW and now, aha, that point needs to be up on this point. And some of these others, they're snapping as close as they can. But remember, we told them they were free in W. So it's just going to go to the closest point it can find. It doesn't, it doesn't really care that this is over here. So it needs to be set up in such a way that the points that we give it are in an appropriate location to where it can try and minimize without, you know, trying to target the wrong point on the curve which is what happened here. Um, but this so I would, I mean, I would approach this a little bit of a different way, Brandon. Um, when I try and match a wing with fit model, I always try and match plan form first. Um, I ignore the upper certain lower surface of the wing. Yeah. In fact, I'll yeah. try and go in and only pick out the leading edge point and trailing edge point of a section. And I'll do my fit model using the leading edge and trailing edge point to get the plan form as well as the twist and dihedral as correct as I can. I'll then come in and I'll probably add a simple airfoil, but I'll only adjust the thickness to cord and I'll just pick a few points on the top surface to get the T over C right. I'll then look at the trailing edge and if it's a thick blunt trailing edge, then I'll go to the modify tab and I'll allow it to just adjust the trailing edge thickness to match. And now you're left with just sort of controlling the camber overall. And in this case, a lot of aft camber. But the important thing is that if you go through this process, you can do a better job of making sure that the points are not associated with the opposite side of the geometry and you're only sort of controlling things uh, as the complexity grows. So that that's sort of my personal way of approaching wings. Um, you're absolutely right. If you just, you know, taps 10 feet back and, and grab a thousand points on the surface of the wing and you add a default wing and you hit fit, it's never going to work. So, um, yeah. What I what I like to say about fit model is it's really not that much better. <laughs> it's not that much better than if you were just moving the sliders by hand. <laughs> and and I mean that in the way that it it's doing the exact same thing, right? It, the only difference is, is it can move the sliders much faster than you can, and it's doing a least squares optimization. So it can find mm -hmm. a truly optimal setting of the sliders. But it's even though it can do it faster and optimally it's no better at it than you are. So, and what I mean is um, approach the problem using fit model the same way you would do it if you were adjusting the sliders manually, just use fit model for that final adjustment. And so if you're doing a wing and I was doing it manually, I wouldn't start by trying to match the details of the airfoil at the beginning. Right. I would start by trying to get the position right. I would literally start with only adjusting the leading edge root of the wing. And once I had the position right, then I would adjust the leading edge tip and then I would get the cord distribution. And I just do sort of one thing at a time, the way I would do it manually, except I would use fit model to help me along in that process. And once I had a parameter adjusted, take it out, don't adjust it again. Once you've positioned the wing in 3D space, 
Don't let it move. Don't let it free up again. And that's how I go through it. Agreed. And um, that's that's absolutely the way that anybody listening, anybody watching the recordings, to do an actual fit of a plan form, start with the biggest stuff first and move on from there. So, you know, that kind of disclaimer on the stuff that we showed there just a moment ago is that that would be an approach to how you can try and get the upper and lower surfaces after you have done all that other stuff. So, um, you know, use with caution. And in, in most cases, you know, the, I would recommend not even going with something like a CST or a, a carbon trefits foil for trying to do stuff like this. If you know or have a pretty darn good idea of what kind of airfoil it is anyway, either from the UIUC database or just from looking at it, use that airfoil. And it's well, going to, I, you're going yeah. to have a better idea of how to fit it. The, the Carmen Treffitz is not really there for real people to use. Um, right. <laughs> the reason Carmen Treffitz is there is because there's a two-dimensional analytical solution for it. So right. it, the Carmen Treffitz airfoil is really only there for use in validation exercises. That if you want to have your code and you want to generate a, a, a KT airfoil and write it out and do a 2D validation, that's why it's there. No real airplanes have a Carmen Trefitz airfoil. So that's, don't even yeah. take that up. Using the CST is fine, um, but I would definitely, if you know it's got a, you know, a NACA six digit airfoil or, or something like that, then obviously use that as the parameterization. Uh, if it's something else, using CST is fine, but what I would, I would start with, this is a little bit nuanced, but I would start with the, you know, a simple NACA airfoil. I would start with an analytical airfoil and again, I would dial in the thickness to cord first. I would then dial in the trailing edge bluntness. I would then, you know, try and dial in some camber. And I would do that on a regular airfoil. And if the fit was still not sufficient, all of these airfoils have a button that will convert it to the best fit of a CST. And so what you can do is you first go through a process of getting the say the five digit modified airfoil that best represents the data and once you've once you've come to your wits end there once you've gotten the best you can do you then hit one button and now the initial guess for the cst picks up where you left off and so now you know again you can avoid that problem of associating points with the wrong side of the geometry and and trying to get some of those things wrong by converting that that complicated airfoil to a CST to start with. And that'll get you a, a lot better ability to then go in and use the CST to just sort of nuance the details you couldn't get otherwise. Yep, all great points. And, um, you know, appreciate the additions there, Rob, because that, that's good guidance and, uh, and good practice for everybody that's listening in. So, um, you know, heed the master. Um, there's another uh, request for, you know, tutorials and stuff here. It's, you know, how can you import things into MATLAB for further analysis? Um, there are uh, demonstrations, uh, I believe a recorded presentation from last year about how to uh, set up the MATLAB API and uh, some discussions about that. Um, so we won't, uh, we won't go back and, and do that again. And of course, there's always like parsing all of the output files that are available. So if you you know, need the polar data, or if you just need information about the geometry, um, you can parse any type of output from an analysis that's written out. So um, you can do that as well. But um, if, you, if you've connected through the API, you don't need to. Right. Because the right. API will give you all that stuff in memory. Um, yeah, the, the right answers, if you're using MATLAB and you want to work closely with VSP um, and not just sort of do it through files, watch, I think it was either Justin or Nick Brake's presentation last year on compiling the API. And there's a presentation last year on setting up MATLAB and compiling the API. That's gonna be, that's the ultimate answer. The other thing that we do have tight coupling with MATLAB is the DGEN geom analysis will actually write out an M file. And so yes. then you yes. can just run that M file in MATLAB and it'll load just a tremendous amount of information into memory. And so if you look in the VSP distribution, in the examples scripts, there's a little bit of a, there's a MATLAB script in there that will help you visualize the contents of a DGEN geom file. Um, but that's the other thing that we have that really supports MATLAB directly is the ability to write a DGEN geom file to that. And I'm not sure if there's a video recording, but we've done presentations on what DGEN geom is all about at several of the past workshops. 
probably one of the recordings. So you might go watch that and then try loading that M file into MATLAB and see what you've got. Yep. And uh, for the viewers, I, I showed where in the, um, the MATLAB folder those examples are. And, um, and uh, for anyone that cares to, to look, the um, demonstration about the OpenVSP API in both MATLAB and Python uh, is here on the 2020 workshop page down here about uh, fourth or fifth from the bottom. Uh, so that's right there.